Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, it, is, it is an honor uh, to be invited here. Uh, I must uh, start with a word of apology. Uh, I've started with a word of a thank. Let me add a word of apology. I have a feeling that what, what I'm about to say may be actually less relevant uh, to, to, or of, of less interest to you than, than much of what has been said. And I knew that coming in, and I'll explain why that is so, but as I was hearing the presentations earlier, and especially the last panel, I kept thinking that maybe this is even less relevant. Uh, than I thought. I want to focus, I, I'm not going to focus on accounting. I'm not an accountant. Uh, so rather than abuse your t intelligence by, by trying to talk like an accountant, I'll try to talk like myself and hope that you can then put it into the context of your profession. I'm also not going to focus on Pakistan because uh, this is a panel on the global dynamics. And I'm going to assume that my, my mentor of many years, um, who's going to speak after me, uh, Kardar Saab, is going to talk about what we think about the global economy these days when we think about the financial crisis, the debt crisis, the housing crisis, the uh, supposed fall of the euro, uh, the monetary uh, issues in the world. And so all of that I'm going to put on the side. Now, as you can notice, right at the beginning I put these things on the side. So what am I going to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about some of the great global trends which I think and many other people think, the literature thinks, are going to impact the direction of the future economy. And by future, I don't mean next year. I don't mean next election. I'm talking now about the next decade and more. So in some ways, please bear with me. If you want to sleep, this is the time to do so uh, because I am going to be less relevant in that way. I want to raise three questions. I want to raise three questions in the next few minutes. I promise not to answer any of them, because if I answered them, then what would be left to talk about? Uh, but three questions that I want to raise, the first of those is, how can we best prepare ourselves for the global shift that is happening and will happen? And I'm talking here not only about the global economic shift, but the global technological shift. In some ways, my premise is that we are so consumed in the moment. We are so consumed in the politics and economic challenges of today, as we should be, as we saw in the last panel, that the world is passing us by. And we are not even noticing that we are living in a dramatic global moment and missing out on some of these trends. So how can we best prepare for them? The second question I want to focus on is, what is the nature of globalness in our global, globalized world? We keep talking about this world, global, global change, global economy, global climate change, uh, kuna matada, everyone together. What does global mean? And I want to talk about that in a minute. And what does it mean for a country like Pakistan? And the third question I want to focus on is how the economic shift for a country like Pakistan is in fact a development and a security shift. That in fact what we've been talking about is not just the economy, not just the fiscal issue, but the development context of that and the security context of that. And I want to maybe put the word security in a slightly different framework than, than my friend Moeed does on most of his shows. I'm going to talk about the three questions in a slightly different order because it makes more sense, but that's what I want to do in the, many, uh, in the few minutes I have. As I said, I want to tell you three stories. Anyone can make up facts, but stories have meaning. And you can, you can put the meaning you want in the story. So I want you to tell, tell you three stories about the global shift in the global order. The first is a story that answers the question, who? Who is global and who gets impacted by global and how does that relate to us? The second is a story about what? What is the impact of this global moment? And so the argument is that we are living in a global moment, that what happens in the globe affects us. And the third is a story about how, which is what do you do about it, the strategy of globalness, if you will. And again, I apologize if this is slightly different from some of the previous presentations, but bear with me. Let me, let me, let me take you through a little thought experiment. Bear with me. Professors do this, unfortunately. A little thought experiment. Imagine for a moment that you are not at ICAP. Imagine for a moment that you are not in Lahore. Imagine for a moment you are not in Pakistan. Imagine for a moment you are not even on the planet Earth. Imagine for a moment that you are on some other planet. Choose your planet. You can take any of them. And from that planet, you are looking down on the planet Earth. 
and you are trying to write like the World Bank writes, a three-page report, three pages and no more, on the state of this country called Earth. Right? We, all, we, we think about countries. We say America as a China as a Pakistan as a India as a. So if someone is looking from Mars down on planet Earth, and they look at planet Earth, and within that they look at us in Pakistan, what do they see? What sort of a country would they see? Bear with me. Bear with me. If we want to understand the global problem, we need to think at the global level. I would posit to you that if the world was a country, so the question is, if the world is a country, what sort of a country is it? If the world was a country, the first thing you would figure out is it's a very poor country. By all the measures we all know, the world as a country is a poor country. It is a country where a billion people live on less than $2 a day. A country where 2 billion people live on less than $2.5 a day. It used to be $2, but the dollar ain't what it used to be, so the World Bank changed their measure. So it's a poor country. You would come to the conclusion it's a poor country, but it's also a divided country. Where there are people like you and me who don't live on those numbers, it's a divided country because 80% of its resources are in the hand of 20% of its people. And 20% of the world's resources is all you have for the remaining 80%. This is not about rich country, poor country. This is about rich person, poor person. This is about the person who's in the PC and not in the PC. This is true for Boston, this is true for Lahore. You would come to the conclusion that the world as a country is a degraded country. Its water is not worth drinking, that's why we have these bottles. Its forests are denuded, its land is degraded, its climate is changing, its seas are rising. So in every term, the world as a country is a degraded country. You would come to the conclusion that the world is an insecure country. By every measure of the term, not just needless war, but food insecurity and water insecurity and climate insecurity and each type of human insecurity, the world is an insecure country. People feel insecure. You and I feel insecure. That's why they have the guards outside. You would come to the conclusion that it is a poorly governed country. You know, if you think about how the world is governed, how the United Nations runs itself, all countries are equal, five are more equal than others, sometimes even Pakistan looks like a well-governed country you would come to the conclusion that the world as a country is an unsafe country. If the U.S. had a travel advisory on the planet Earth, it would be to catch the first rocket ship out of here. Because by all the measures by which we gauge countries, the world is an unsafe country. Now, why am I doing this to you at the end of this wonderful conference, giving you a bleak picture? I'm trying to make the argument that our world, the globe that we are talking about, is a third world country.